Go ahead. Welcome everyone to our second session of Brain Boosters, Fads, Facts, and Fundamentals. My name is Julie Garden Robinson and I'm a professor at North Dakota State University. And we are hoping that you will join us again on November 19th and December 10th. On the 19th, you'll be learning about modifying dietary behaviors and, and its effects on brain health. And on December 10th, we will have an applied session for applying this information to extension outreach programs. And again, all sessions will be recorded. So here's our team. There are two Julies and two Wendy's. So that's a little confusing sometimes. But we are a team comprised of Floridians and a person from Virginia. And of course, I'm from North Dakota State. So check out all their titles and um, they will be helping in the background today. So here's some assorted information. We will have a certificate of attendance at the end of the Qualtrics evaluation. And we certainly hope that you will take a couple minutes to fill out the evaluation. Again, we will record all the sessions and we will email the session to those who could not attend today. And if you like the session, we hope that you will tell your coworkers because we're trying to grow these webinars and it can be a real nice way to get some updates from people from around the country. So today we will be using the chat box a bit. So I hope you can find the chat box. If you have questions, we will have people monitoring the chat box so that our speakers can address those questions at the end of their sessions. Each speaker will have about 20, 25 minutes and then a little time for questions. And again, please complete the short evaluation that will be sent to you immediately after the webinar because we really do value your feedback. That's how we got the idea to do this Brain Booster session this year. And with that, I am pleased to introduce my colleague at North Dakota State University. Dr. Ryan McGrath is an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Nutrition, and Exercise Sciences. He's also an affiliate faculty for the Center for Large Data and Data Sharing and Rehabilitation at the University of Texas Medical Branch. He also is a very prolific author of journal articles, and I'm excited to hear about his research. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Julie, for the introduction. And thanks all for uh, taking the time to be here. And, and thanks all for having me uh, give this presentation. Um, again, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Health, Nutrition and Exercise Sciences and an affiliate faculty uh, in the Center for Large Data Research and Data Sharing and Rehabilitation. Uh, my background is really driven in exercise science. And uh, aside from my education and training in exercise science, a lot of my experience is also in uh, the area of exercise science. Uh, just really briefly, research interests include epidemiology of aging, uh, topics related to physical activity and health across, across the lifespan, and a variety of populations. This may include uh, younger populations, persons with disabilities, um, but I would say I have particular interests in older adults and trying to promote successful aging. Uh, also interested in looking at how we ascertain certain variables and certain measurement techniques and maybe making advancements or looking at different measurement methodologies a different way so we can measure certain variables a little bit differently. But with respect to today's presentation, we're going to be evaluating and discussing the role of muscle strength and brain health. And this would be a good opportunity for me to suggest that this is a very interesting topic. It's a topic that is trending right now in the research literature. Uh, but muscle strength is only one factor that may contribute to brain health. And brain health is something that can be, I think, defined very differently across a number of different individuals. But nevertheless, the, the role of muscle strength and how it's linked to brain health is interesting. Uh, and one may not suspect that there is a linkage that does occur. And we want to think about the role of muscle strength and how do we measure muscle strength specifically. And this is not necessarily going into a gym setting and pre performing a variety of exercise movements, such as maybe a bicep curl, or a bench press or putting a really heavy bar on your back and squatting it a bunch of times. Uh, muscle strength in epidemiological and clinical settings is actually measured much differently. And one of the more convenient assessments of uh, measuring muscle strength is with a hand grip dynamometer. And what you 
are seen on your screen right now is an example of what a hand grip dynamometer may look like. It's hydraulic. Uh, it's relatively simple to perform in that uh, you are given the dynamometer with instructions as to how to complete the measurement. Oftentimes you will hold the device and have your arm bent at 90 degrees and will squeeze the dynamometer with maximal effort for just a number of seconds really and then release those muscle contractions. Usually you will perform two measurements on each hand and the highest uh, measurement in kilograms or force is the measurement that you would be including in an assessment of strength capacity. So simple, easy to perform, oftentimes done in clinical and epidemiological settings. So based off of that description or what you may already know about hand grip strength, maybe think to yourself or maybe you can chime in on the message board and chat board, do you think that hand grip strength is a good proxy measure or assessment of overall strength capacity? Yes, no, or maybe. Let's take a moment to think about that. And really, uh, the, the scientific approach would be to have this be a maybe type of answer rather than having a definitive yes or no. And there, as I mentioned before, are a number of ways to assess overall strength capacity, but the validity of the measurement and the feasibility of the measurement does need to have important consideration, particularly with populations that you may be working with or accessibility of the instrument that you have uh, available to you. And there is a wide range in the validity and feasibility in the assessment, but nevertheless, hand grip dynamometry or dynamometry at a single site of the body does provide a robust amount of information and it is highly feasible to perform. With these data, we can, for example, evaluate the role of clinical weakness or a diagnosis of weakness just based off absolute hand grip strength alone. So for example, in the literature, looking at sex stratified categorical weakness thresholds, Men that may have a hand grip strength that is less than 26 kilograms would be considered categorically weak. Similarly, women that have a hand grip strength less than 16 kilograms may also be considered weak. You could stratify uh, based off of a number of different factors too, such as rate or ethnicity, uh, based on hand grip strength status. And then likewise, you can also look at these data more so continuously. Uh, the, the larger figures that you may see on the right side would indicate more so of a norm reference standard or a percentile chart wherein you can determine where your hand grip strength compares to your peers based off of your age. Maybe it would be at the 60th percentile or at the 70th percentile. Uh, but nevertheless, these, these categorical or continuous measures are being uh, performed in clinical settings and are being categorized and individuals are being diagnosed as perhaps clinically weak with these criteria. With this information, uh, the hand grip strength is relatively inexpensive. It's easily to purchase. A hand grip dynamometer may range somewhere between $40 all the way up to $300, depending on uh, the type of hand grip dynamometer that you would like to purchase. So relative to other measurements, it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, simple to perform, as I mentioned before. Um, it, it takes a matter of seconds. It's considered to be a, a maximal isometric grip force task. Uh, very non-invasive. Uh, very simple to describe, very simple to complete for the most part. Uh, you're seeing, I think, measures of hand grip strength being overall used in the literature much more frequently. If you were to for perhaps uh, just put in hand grip dynamometry or hand grip strength in a search engine such as PubMed, you'll see that the number of studies over uh, the last decade has rapidly increased. And you're seeing also a lot of larger scale epidemiological studies or population-based studies, such as the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, Health and Retirement Study, incorporate measures of hand grip strength because it's easy to perform and provides a lot of robust health information. Aside from the health information that hand grip strength does provide, uh, hand grip strength can be used also in a decision tree algorithm for diagnosing sarcopenia, which is a unique way of saying age-related low muscle mass, or decision tree algorithms related to dynapenia, which is age-related low muscle strength. So there could be a lot of things that contribute to strength capacity, but another question that you may want to consider is, does the lower muscle strength, in this case as measured by hand grip strength, more so a product of a, diminished muscular system function, b, 
diminished neural system function, or C, both diminished muscular and neural system functioning. So again, just take a moment, think to yourself, chat board. Okay. Similar to the previous answer, there are a lot of factors that may contribute to lower muscle strength and looking at it at more so of a bodily system level, muscular and neural system functioning may be both determinants to lower strength capacity. This is a very nice diagram that helps to outline the characteristics that might contribute to dynopenia, which is again another way of characterizing uh, age-related low muscle strength. And some of these factors may be done at the muscular system level, and that may include lifestyle behaviors or other age-related system deficits that might be occurring. There also might be a nervous system contribution that might be happening, which is, the res as a result, the linkage to cognitive functioning that, that might be occurring. So maybe let's look at some of the investigations now that have examined the associations between low hand grip strength and cognitive functioning and maybe how the nervous system factors into that association. So these are the overarching results of a, a larger investigation of roughly 15,000 older Americans that were followed for about eight years. And there was a, a signal for the association between hand grip strength and cognitive impairment. Specifically, the table does outline that every five kilogram lower hand grip strength was associated with a 10% increased odds for any cognitive impairment. Five kilogram lower hand grip strength was associated with an 18% greater odds for severe cognitive impairment. So looking at cognitive uh, functioning a little bit differently. And then similarly, because this was more so of a longitudinal analysis and looking at the progression of cognitive impairment from known cognitive impairment to any cognitive impairment to severe cognitive impairment, hand grip strength also was associated with uh, poor cognitive functioning in that case by 10%. Now, this investigation led to another similar investigation, which examined the bidirectionality in the role of hand grip strength and cognitive functioning. And it's difficult to determine if it's low muscle strength that is a factor that would help to predict or be associated with cognitive functioning, or if it's the cognitive functioning factor and the, the low neural system deficits that might be occurring as a result of cognitive functioning that's contributing to hand grip strength losses or losses in strength capacity. And the overarching results of this investigation, which was again, another investigation of about 17,000 older Americans um, that were followed for 10 years in this case, demonstrated that no matter how you categorize the data, whether you look at the data continuously, categorically, for both hand grip strength and cognitive functioning, there is bidirectionality in that association. And this demonstrates that losses of functioning and strength capacity may help to forecast losses of functioning in your overall cognition. And that similarly, uh, losses of cognitive functioning may forecast lower strength capacity. So a bidirectional association may be existing in that regard. Instrumental activities of daily living is another way that an individual may examine uh, cognitive functioning or at least the, the onset of cognitive declines. And it's oftentimes done with a simple self-report questionnaire in which you may be evaluating a series of tasks. Uh, these tasks tend to be more neurophysiological and oftentimes assess ability to live independently. And you may respond uh, having no difficulty, some difficulty or a complete inability to using a map, preparing hot meals, taking medications, managing money, using a telephone and shopping for groceries. Nevertheless, if you were to evaluate this table, uh, looking at model three in this investigation of again, about 15,000 older Americans that were followed for eight years, every five kilogram decrease in hand grip strength was differentially associated with each of those IADL limitations. In this case, ranging from 5% from using a telephone all the way up to 11% for using a map. This is a Sankey bar chart. Uh, it's a little bit colorful and maybe difficult to follow at first, but uh, the different colors, the cooler colors would indicate fewer numbers of IADL limitations. That's kind of what I described before with the number of tasks that might be necessary for uh, independent living, such as using a telephone, managing medications, et cetera. Um, and the hot colors would be having a deficit in several of those functions. 
And notice that IADL uh, limitations can be fluid and that over time individuals may be able to regain functions or lose functions. And hand grip strength certainly does factor in here wherein if we do help to determine losses in strength, um, it's highly predictive of losses in IADL capacity. And similarly, if an individual is able to maybe go through a rehabilitation program or engage in healthy lifestyle behaviors that may increase strength capacity or other healthy lifestyle factors, um, you may be able to regain some of those IADL functions. Another, uh, this is an, the results of another investigation that would indicate that the neural system is very much a player in the, the association between cognitive functioning and strength capacity. Uh, this is just looking at the overall strength level of individuals that may be aging or having experiencing uh, cognitive deficits. Um, and it's oftentimes thought that the, the same system processes that are helping to regulate muscle contractions are also the same processes that are helping cognitive function and that they have a shared cause. And this is demonstrated here, whereas individuals that are more so weak have really poor voluntary activation and that they don't have the ability to maybe activate their skeletal muscles at the level that an individual that is healthier or younger or does more so cognitively intact would be able to. So the neural system firing is actually something that would also help to contribute to weakness and be a predictor of cognitive impairment. Likewise, this is a, an investigation that was put out by colleagues at Ohio University, uh, just looking less at a maximum grip force task, such as a measure of hand grip strength, and more so at performing more so dynamic functions, maybe walking or performing different jump type activities. So more of like a dynamic assessment. Similarly, individuals that might be older or experiencing cognitive deficits have uh, difficulty performing these types of tasks and also performing more vigorous movements, thereby demonstrating that the voluntary activation to the skeletal muscles just is a little bit more limited in individuals that might have a cognitive impairment. As demonstrated before, there tends to be a bidirectionality in the association between hand, hand grip strength or strength capacity and cognitive outcomes. Likewise, if you were to look at hand grip strength differently and the role of muscle weakness differently and try and determine if it's more of a, a muscular system level problem that's occurring, you're seeing bidirectional associations that are occurring for each of those outcomes. So when you do see bidirectional associations for strength capacity and say Alzheimer's disease, or strength capacity and diabetes, uh, looking and trying to evaluate if there's third factors or mediating factors might be a really nice target uh, for helping break that association. And maybe that would be a nice way to implement an intervention, for example, and help individuals uh, maybe regain cognitive functioning or strength capacity. And there could be a lot of mediating variables that are included. They could be lifestyle factors. They could be factors related to the environment in which you are located. There could be genetic factors that maybe you have less control over or other mediating factors that we're just not aware of. And by helping to determine those mediating factors, maybe we can parse out more so if uh, lower strength capacity and the association with strength capacity and cognitive function is more so driven by the nervous system or if it's more at the muscular system level. Um, and I think that would be an overall con contribution to just overall health in general. So there also could be factors that contribute to strength capacity as measured by hand grip strength. Engaging in physical activity throughout the lifespan is something that would help to preserve strength capacity and has demonstrated efficacy for overall cognitive functioning. Um, hand grip strength is oftentimes used in perhaps nutrition uh, interventions and can be a good reflector of overall nutritional status. And nutrition is a very important part in strength capacity and cognitive functioning. And there certainly could be something wherein uh, nutrition could factor into hand grip strength as well. Uh, individuals that may have morbidity, for example, uh, such as maybe a cognitive impairment or even diabetes, uh, individuals that do have morbidity but also have higher strength capacity uh, tend to have lower odds for an adverse health outcome that might be related to the health condition that they already have. So uh, a lot of things can contribute to improving strength capacity and strength capacity can also be a good predictor in a number of different populations for future adverse health events, uh, irrespective, I think, of, of cognitive functioning in general.
So as a result, hand grip strength can be used as a clinically viable screening tool just for overall health assessment. Um, but I, I think that we are getting closer and closer to having hand grip strength be a part of cognitive functioning screenings for helping to uh, diagnose perhaps a cognitive impairment. Uh, it's a powerful biomarker of AGA nevertheless and a vital sign of overall health. Um, it's associated with quite a bit. And nevertheless, I think that you're seeing uh, clinicians incorporate measures of hand grip strength because of its simplicity and robustness in just overall routine geriatric health assessments. Emails listed. Uh, thanks for your time. If there is a little bit of time for any chatter, uh, I can happy to, to chat a little bit with anybody. Uh, but but thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. We do have a, a comment and a question came from Michelle. Older rural adults milked cows by hand. Our youth today are playing video games that don't require <laughs> much grip strength. What is the long-term prognosis for our youth if they aren't physically active? Uh, the youth, should, I would say that we want to encourage our youth to be more so physically active. Um, if you were to maybe rewind and look at my slides earlier, individuals that are less physically active tend to have lower strength capacity, and that's putting them at risk for, I think, poor health problems, not only at the present, but a lot of poor health outcomes in the future. So encouraging activity and other healthy lifestyle behaviors such as a nutritious diet certainly should be encouraged. Um, so I, I would recommend that maybe they put the, the video game controller down for a little bit um, as it would be, probably be a good idea for their overall health. And I think we'd all agree. Um, here's another question. What are some common interventions with frail older adults? It's difficult. The efficacy of implementing an intervention in individuals that are already frail can be challenging because there are restrictions on what you can do and the efficacy is, is a little bit limited. Um, actually, one of the unique things that might be going on now is the role of social integration and trying to develop social relationships either with uh, a peer or a role model or a family member to help improve healthy lifestyle behaviors is a trending topic in the literature right now. That may help to improve the frailty status a little bit or even regain some of those frailty phenotypes that might be occurring. So that sense of relatedness within a relationship is a very important factor for maintaining adherence to healthy lifestyle behaviors. Uh, here's another question from Corey. Will strength training help improve diabetes? It may help to improve diabetes. Uh, strength training, either concurrently with another exercise mode, such as aerobic training, would help to improve diabetes markers. Uh, so concurrent strength training with other modes of training is certainly recommended, and perhaps even could be recommended in accordance with things like Tai Chi, which I think my next presenter will touch on in just a moment. Well, I say that's a great segue. Um... Ryan, if you would stop sharing, and then Matthew, if you'd remember to unmute and then accept control. And thank you again, Ryan. That was very interesting. Definitely. All right, your screen is up. Just need to switch to your PowerPoint. Is this the one? No, that's the handout. So the PowerPoint that I'm looking for is the one that I have on my machine? Yep, or is it, it is. Not one that we're sharing. Okay. You're going to share your screen. Gotcha. I, uh, for some reason, I thought we were, uh, we were sharing something through Zoom. So, sorry, give me just a no second. No problem. Matthew is a newbie when it comes to webinars. So, uh, he's practicing on us. And if you can't find it easily, I can probably. <laughs> I got it. Okay. No problem. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Okay, so you all can see that. We can. All right. All right, so I will introduce Dr. Matthew Kamelski. He is an advanced instructor in the Department of Human Development and Family Science at Virginia Tech. He has master's and doctoral degrees in human development and has received several teaching awards according to his Vita. Currently is the curriculum lead on the adaptive brain and behavior 
Behavior Curriculum Committee, and he does outreach in the area of mindfulness. So thank you, Dr. Matthew Kamelski, for being with us today and telling us some new things about cognitive function. Thank you, Julie, and, and thanks a lot, Ryan. That was really um, interesting uh, presentation, and it overlaps a lot with some of the stuff we're seeing in, in Tai Chi as well. So um, thanks for inviting me, and I'll just uh, get right into it. So um, uh, my question for you all is, how many of you have ever practiced Tai Chi, which is spelled sometimes T-A-I-C-H-I and sometimes T-A-I-J-I? Um, there's a couple of different ways for uh, transliterating Chinese into um, Roman uh, characters. So you may see it spelled either way. Um, and so I'll uh, let you guys tell me what that prevalence is uh, um, uh, later. Maybe we can, we can, um, we can get an estimate. Um, so a 2016 report uh, based on the National Health Information Survey um, uh, suggests that uh, about 3.1% of the U.S. population practiced Tai Chi at some point, and um, as much as 1.2% have practiced for a year or more. So it is a, a practice that we find here in the United States. Um, uh, although in China, it's practiced by people of all ages, it's quite popular in the U.S. as being a, a, a practice for um, uh, adults and aging adults. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, so what is Tai Chi? If you don't know what Tai Chi is, um, it's actually, uh, there are actually um, six or more major systems of Tai Chi. These are meditative movement practices. They have their roots in traditional Chinese meditation, martial arts, and traditional Chinese health and healing practices. Don't let the martial arts part scare you away. In most Tai Chi classes, you're not going to find people throwing each other. It's not like judo. Um, most of the time, people aren't punching each other like karate. Um, but the movement patterns themselves uh, uh, have their connection with traditional um, Chinese martial arts. Some advanced practitioners may engage in self-defense training as well, but it's not a common part of most Tai Chi classes that we find here in the U.S. Tai Chi is practiced worldwide predominantly for health promotion, well-being, and optimal aging. And in fact, there's a, um, there's a holiday um, that me and many of my colleagues who are in the Tai Chi world celebrate every year. It's the last Saturday of April. So in April, you've noticed like an unusual number of practicing Tai Chi in the park. Um, that's where World Tai Chi Day happens or when it happens. Um, and folks practice all over the world at 10 a.m. Um, in each time zone, you can find people um, out practicing Tai Chi just as a kind of celebration um, of this practice. Uh, what are the traditional motivations for practice? So before I get into some of the uh, analysis of, of cognitive function, I'd just like to say that Tai Chi is known to have a lot of benefits and traditionally people who practice um, report a lot of benefits. So um, one, of the, one of the oldest motivations for practice have, has to do with health, healing, and longevity. It's, it has for hundreds of years thought to relate to that. Um, a lot of people who practice who I've surveyed in my research um, and others have surveyed talk about regulation of mood. It puts them in a better mood. They sleep easier and it also helps with regulation of pain. This painting that I've included here is a, is a, is a reproduction. The one in the bottom is a reproduction of very old scroll work. Um, that dates back thousands of years. And uh, it's thought that these practices were being done to help with um, rheumatic or arthritic conditions. Um, strength and endurance. A lot of people who practice re report particularly lower extremity strength and feeling like they have more endurance. Mobility and balance, which we see a lot in the literature. Um, a lot of people report that their Tai Chi practice augments, complements, supplements, supports other activities. So they'll say things like, because I do Tai Chi, I can you know, walk farther, or um, I can go hiking, or I feel like I have more energy to do things with my grandchildren. Um, and a lot of people um, report it helping them to uh, um, alleviate stress so that they're more productive, so that they have more time to spend on other things. And I think that's really interesting because that kind of overlaps with the World Health Organization's general view of health as a resource. So we think about health as something that we have kind of like money. Like if you have health, you can spend it. 
in any way that you need to spend it so that you can be more productive or more generative, give back to your community. And a lot of Tai Chi practitioners feel that Tai Chi is like this for them. It helps them to have the resources that they need that they can use however um, they see fit towards their art, towards their family, towards their community. Um, and so these are sort of the, this, these are the self-reported benefits. You'll notice that, that nobody talks about cognition, right? People don't say, well, I, I'm reporting it's improved my cognition. So it's really interesting that we're researching cognition, but for somebody who, who knows anything about cognition and what you just learned, of course, from the last presentation by Ryan, is that actually cognitive function and strength have this relationship. Mobility and balance have a relationship with cognitive function as well as regulation of mood. Um, we also know that things like pain and inflammation um, can be threats to cognition because um, that can indicate um, um, potential threats to the nervous system when our bodies are overloaded with, um, with pain and inflammatory markers. So there's actually a lot that has to do with cognition that's sort of hidden in these self-reports, even though nobody's speaking specifically about you know, better memory or better executive function. People don't really talk that way um, uh, when, they're, when they're getting self-reports. So um, in 2013, there was a review that was trying to understand um, why Tai Chi is so beneficial and what are the potential um, mechanisms through which it may be affecting brain structure and function. So there have been a number of studies that have demonstrated that Tai Chi can actually um, restructure the brain to be more efficient. Uh, it can increase brain mass um, uh, in the gray matter regions. Um, and there are studies that are ongoing looking at how Tai Chi affects the brain, both in terms of structure, function, mass. Um, and so um, the, the purpose of this review was to sort of hypothesize or theorize, you know, how Tai Chi may be affecting cognition. And so Tai Chi is a really complex practice. A lot of people think of it as a kind of slow moving choreography, and it can be. It can involve other practices too that may not be related to choreography, that look more like calisthenic practices. Um, it can involve practices that involve two people working together, um, gently pushing or pulling on each other to improve each other's balance. Um, and so those have exercise value. Um, and so uh, they tie into cardiovascular fitness. So many types of Tai Chi are about the, um, they, they provide the cardiovascular benefits of brisk walking. Some types are a little gentler, so they may be kind of low, uh, um, low in terms, of, in terms of their cardiovascular output, but most tend to be around a moderate level. Um, motor fitness in terms of coordination and motor control, um, movement coordination status, Tai Chi uh, tends to be practiced in, in communities, um, and folks who are part of the Tai Chi community tend to be pretty involved. So the social interaction in the Tai Chi community is a little bit more um, like, a, uh, like a fraternity or a sorority um, or uh, um, a church community, and maybe less like the kind of exercise class that many people go to um, when you uh, simply go to a, a gym, you go to an exercise class, you don't really talk to anybody, you leave. That happens a lot. Tai Chi classes tend not to be that way. People tend to be involved in each other's lives, looking out for each other. Um, if somebody doesn't show up, a lot of times people will contact them. So there's a pretty intense social interaction through Tai Chi. Um, and then Tai Chi is also a form of moving meditation. A lot of Tai Chi classes um, involve coming to understand how meditation works and actually practicing meditation in motion. We know that meditation independently, that each of these things independently can affect brain structure um, and function, uh, which of course uh, impact cognition. Now, one thing that's not on here that I think is really important that we know about meditation in particular is that there's a response that experienced meditators can get even with just a few hours practice called the relaxation response. And the relaxation response includes um, a lowering of blood pressure. It also includes a reduction in inflammatory markers. And this can be very powerful when it comes to the um, cardiovascular and inflammation health. Um, and both of those are known to affect the brain um, through, um, 
through strokes and other kinds of vascular events, even minor vascular events in the brain that might affect cognitive function. Um, and, uh, um, and also the uh, onset of dementia, which also is, is, is tied to increased inflammation. So this relaxation response that a lot of people um, uh, report during practice and that we can see, we can measure through things like cortisol. Um, this can be, I think, also very, very powerful in terms of its protective effects um, against stress, uh, both physical, psychological, and social stress. Um, uh, that can be uh, a threat um, to, uh, to cognition and to um, uh, the health of the brain. So moving on from um, that theoretical work, uh, in 2014, um, there was a review of Tai Chi and cognitive performance. Um, and uh, that review involved looking at 20 studies. And there are a lot more studies that were done than this, but um, this review was really focused on, on studies that were um, that, that had a, a, a moderate to high quality. Um, and so of those um, 20, there were 11 randomized controlled trials, which are often seen as a kind of gold standard for research. This is the kind of trial you might do if you were trying to introduce a, a drug to improve cognitive performance. Um, uh, the ones that weren't randomized controlled trials was, were still included, but there were, they had some um, ways of determining what to include, what not to include, based on whether or not they felt the study was biased. So they included 20 in all, it was about 2,553 participants that they re-crunched the numbers on. So the idea with this kind of review, which is referred to as meta-analysis, is that you pool the numbers from many studies um, in order to try to um, give you a little bit more strength in the analysis. And so um, what they found was um, that measures of executive function that there were large effects among healthy older adults um, in terms of uh, improvements to executive function after just a few weeks of Tai Chi training. Um, they also found that there were smaller but significant effects even among adults with MCI and early stage dementia. Now this presentation isn't specifically about MCI and dementia, but there are a lot of studies and there are some reviews that are coming out on MCI and early stage dementia and Tai Chi and other kinds of mind-body practices. Um, and there do seem to be significant benefits um, for folks in the early stages. This term executive function, I've included a footnote down here. Um, this is kind of a catch-all term, but it's really um, important um, because executive function is something that we refer to um, that regulates the uh, um, the control of cognitive processes, such as planning, working memory, um, attention, problem solving, verbal reasoning, um, inhibition. Um, you can read the whole footnote there. Executive function is our ability to kind of put the brakes on when we're on autopilot, to notice um, that something is wrong and stop and do something about it, to make a decision. Um, and uh, executive functioning is something that tends to decline with age, declines more quickly in the presence of things like MCI or dementia. Um, and, um, and so uh, this review was targeting specifically um, executive function uh, and uh, looking at, at the effects of, of Tai Chi on that. Um, it's important uh, for balance and postural control, but we can also see some connection between executive function and any volitional movement. I think Ryan, um, mentioned that in, 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 uh, in his presentation. Anytime you make a choice to do something that's not automatic, you're trying to do something that's difficult, you're trying to um, even to use um, you know, strength, but you're using that strength in a very intentional way um, to do something that's not a kind of common automatic task, you're going to involve executive function. And so um, stopping suddenly because you know, something's in your way or moving out of the way or um, you know, having to suddenly reach and grab for something, uh, the kinds of things that you might do when your driving environment is changing, all of these involve executive function um, uh, as well as other kinds of tasks that might be you know, thought of as, as more dealing with math or letters, um, uh, language and things like that can involve executive function as well. So it's really um, a very important aspect. So what did this 
um, of cognition. So what did this study find? Um, their conclusion was that Tai Chi may offer a safe and non-pharmacological approach to enhancing cognitive function um, in older adults because of, of, of these effects. Now, there have been more studies since 2014, and most of them have been in the direction of, um, of, of um, finding Tai Chi is, uh, has benefits in both populations, both healthy um, aging adults and um, those with early stage uh, dementia and mild cognitive impairment. One of the things that's difficult about practices like Tai Chi in later stages is that it does require a lot of tracking and processing and memory um, for some of the practices in Tai Chi. So it can be difficult to do in the middle to end stages, but for NCI or early stages, there are still many practices within Tai Chi that can be, um, that, that can be done um, with adults even um, with uh, mild levels of impairment. So another more recent review on um, mindfulness-based exercise and cognitive performance uh, was um, just published. Mindfulness-based exercise, essentially, you know, if I were to go back to this slide here um, and we take a look at these factors here that are lined up with Tai Chi, well, you know, what we can say is that, you know, that's, that's not unique to Tai Chi. Actually, Qigong, which is a sister practice to Tai Chi, also has these things in common. So does yoga. Um, and so maybe what we should be looking at is these groups of practices that all belong to this class, um, what, that some people have called meditative movement. Um, I think uh, right now there's a, um, there's a, a kind of a, a turf war between those people who want to say meditative movement and mindfulness space exercise. I'm not sure who's going to win out. But this, uh, this review uh, from 2019 um, uh, was, uh, was titled uh, Mindfulness-Based Exercise and Cognitive Performance. And so it, it lumps together these exercises that sort of bring all of these factors um, together uh, uh, and incorporate them in the exercise, the same list of factors um, that, uh, that I just displayed earlier. So this one had 19 randomized controlled trials, and each of these trials actually had control interventions of some sort, which is really great. That means that we're comparing Tai Chi or Qigong or yoga to other things. So if with a total of 2,539 um, older participants, um, and, and they found significant improvements in executive function. Also, they looked at learning and memory as well as language tasks. Um, uh, in, uh, and so they, they specifically selected studies that could give them a lot of um, outcome data on these regions. So their conclusion, they, they were a little stronger about their conclusion. They believe that mind-body exercises can be safe and effective for enhancing cognitive function among people aged 60 years um, and older. So some other considerations um, uh, about Tai Chi and Qigong um, to keep in mind. One is that these things don't require equipment. So um, you don't, all you need is some space. Um, in fact, there are some studies out there right now that are um, uh, experimenting with virtual or distance learning. Um, uh, tai Chi that people may be able to do actually in the comfort of their own homes. But, you know, doing that, you may be losing some of that social benefit. Um, but uh, if all you need is, you know, is a multi-purpose room to do it or a park outdoors if you've got good weather. Some areas of the country, they can practice outdoors almost every day. I went to University of Hawaii for graduate school, and I can tell you Tai Chi was going on there every day somewhere. Um, and so, you know, if you've got good weather, that's great. If you don't, it doesn't require that much space. A multi-purpose room will do. It doesn't require any special equipment to get started. It's relatively safe. Um, adverse events for Tai Chi are really, really low. Um, tai Chi has been used with frail populations. Um, I have led Tai Chi interventions um, with folks with traumatic brain injuries um, uh, in uh, nursing homes and respite care centers where people are actually engaging in Tai Chi seated. So it's really adaptable. Now, um, the degree to which it can be adaptive is gonna depend a lot on the experience of the instructor, but there are many adaptive forms of Tai Chi 
Um, there's aquatic Tai Chi, it's referred to as I Chi, there's Tai Chi Easy, there's Tai Chi for Arthritis. There are a number of forms of Tai Chi out there that, um, that can be adapted uh, to meet the needs of special populations. Sometimes these adaptations may give you some benefits over others. So for instance, if you were to do, let's say the traditional form of Tai Chi training, the cardiovascular challenge may be much higher versus Tai Chi for arthritis, that cardiovascular challenge may be a little bit lower. So you may not be getting some of the benefits that you would get from a full curriculum, but Tai Chi for arthritis has been studied and there are benefits for Tai Chi for arthritis. It, it, it increases mobility, strength, reduces pain symptoms. So, um, so we, we know that it's still beneficial. When you're doing an adaptive form of Tai Chi, you may not get all the benefits that you would get from the traditional curriculum, but you still get, there's still many benefits to practice. And so one of the areas that we still need to do a lot of research in, that there's research going on in right now, is understanding what the, the differential outcomes are for these adaptive variants of Tai Chi, trying to meet the needs of special populations. Um, and so uh, Tai Chi can be a great complement to other activities and the community programs that I lead. I, I always recommend that if I'm teaching an adaptive form of Tai Chi um, and folks aren't getting the, um, the, the level of cardiovascular exercise that they should be getting from, from that form of Tai Chi, maybe they're doing it for stress relief, maybe they're doing it for pain relief, maybe they can't do um, uh, uh, a more intense form of Tai Chi, um, I'll recommend them to get their cardiovascular exercise and their strength training you know, with a personal trainer, on a cycle, in, in some way that allows them to access that because that's, that's still important. So it can be a really great complement to other activities. Um, I've had folks in my community programs come in um, with canes and after a few weeks, um, they're able to set their canes aside and under, uh, with, you know, in collaboration with their doctor's advice, you know, and do class without, uh, without the cane. And so this, of course, ends up allowing them to do some other activities as well. Um, people who need canes should, of course, always use canes. But the idea that Tai Chi can complement other activities, we see that a lot in self-reports, um, but that always should be done um, in connection with advice from personal trainer or a physician or a therapist or something like that. And then the last thing I'll say is that um, the teacher or coach makes a, a great deal of difference. Um, there's not, um, right now, there's not a standard uh, licensure for Tai Chi teaching. There are certifications out there. Um, uh, the Arthritis Foundation has a certification for Tai Chi for arthritis. You can get certified to teach things, but there's not um, there's, there's not quite the level of organization even that yoga has in terms of um, how many hours a person needs to um, be teaching or have experience in order to teach Tai Chi. Um, so it is important to make sure that um, anyone that you're uh, um, bringing into a community, if you're trying to, I know a lot of your outreach agents you might be thinking about trying to get a Tai Chi program off the ground or supporting a Tai Chi program. Um, it is important to make sure that they are certified. The more years of experience they have practicing and teaching, um, the better, most likely. And um, I would say, you know, um, just like you would for a physician, um, put your ear to the ground, talk to people, um, get references. Um, uh, the, the way that Tai Chi is taught can really vary, and the coach or the teacher can make a lot of difference in terms of um, in terms of safety, in terms of efficacy, um, you know, really get, uh, if you're thinking about starting a program off and you're looking for a teacher, um, don't just ask for certification, but, but, you know, ask for references. If the person's teaching other classes, visit that class, talk to people in that class. Um, and I think that's really the best way to go at this point because we don't have um, uh, a, uh, a unified body that oversees this practice. We don't have a unified system for certifying. We don't have a unified system for reporting if somebody is, um, is, is teaching in a way that may not be safe. And so even though you know, there, there aren't a lot of adverse um, effects going on um, in randomized controlled trials, 
when RCTs happen, we're talking about bringing people in who are, you know, imminently qualified to teach and, and finding people of that caliber may not be so easy to do in every community. So, um, so that, you know, you have to do a little bit of extra work to get one of these programs off the ground. Um, in order to be diligent, in order to make sure that the person you're bringing in is going to be safe um, and has experience working with the population that you want to support. And uh, that is, that's all I've got for you guys. <laughs> Probably a little ahead of myself there. No, you're, you're great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kamelski. We, we had several questions come in, so are you ready for some questions? I am. All right, first one. What is your advice for becoming certified to teach Tai, tai Chi? Um, I think probably one of the one of the best organizations out there is the Center for Tai Chi Studies. Um, and that's um, directed by Dr. Yan Yang. He got his PhD in kinesiology at the University of Illinois. Um, uh, and um, did some research there and has collaborated on a number of research projects. Um, he has, a, a, he teaches at a Memorial Sloan Kettering um, uh, Cancer Center in New York City, um, but travels the country doing workshops and seminars. Um, and so I think his program is probably um, one of the best um, that I've seen out there. It is also, um, uh, it does require a little bit more work. Um, it requires follow-up and continuing education. And so just in terms of quality, I like to recommend this program. There are, I've seen programs out there where you can do like a three-hour workshop and get a certification. And I just, I don't think, I don't think that's where we want to be in terms of, you know, in terms of promoting safe practice in the community. So I, I highly recommend Center for Tai Chi Studies. You can look it up, you can Google it. Dr. Yang Yang, Y-A-N-G, Y-A-N-G. I think he's got one of the best programs out there. All right, thank you. Your next question comes from Kelly. Do you think that other strength or flexibility or balance and self-defense type physical activities have the same benefits as Tai Chi, such as yoga, non-combative, karate, et cetera? Um, I think that the, I think that the, the potential um, is there. We tend to see um, more adverse events reported in studies that involve those things. But, you know, the yoga varies greatly, widely. You can, um, you can have a wonderful yoga teacher who understands restorative yoga, who understands gentle yoga, and, you know, can, can, lead, um, can lead a group of, of, of older adults in practice where there's very low risk of any kind of adverse event. Um, and so a lot of it depends on the teacher. I would say that one of the biggest things that we can learn about mind-body exercise in general when it comes to other forms of exercise is that exercise doesn't just need to be exercise. I was invited to um, uh, the um, National Academy of Sciences um, a few years ago um, where, when they were investigating uh, arts on the brain. And some of the most beneficial arts are multimodal theater arts performing arts because people are getting their exercise and using their brains and socializing all at the same time. So I think that, you know, other forms of exercise where we can incorporate um, socialization, where we can incorporate intentionality, um, but still keep things um, uh, adaptive to where we can meet the needs of populations who may have um, mobility impairments, limitations in terms of range of motion, I think that's really, really important. So yeah, I would say that, it, that it's possible, but it takes, it, it takes a lot of consideration. And that consideration is really baked into Tai Chi because Tai Chi is not about how many reps do you do or how high do you get your heart rate. It's about the quality of the movement. Quality of the movement's really important. So, um, you know, one of the mantras I often hear Dr. Yang says, no pain, lots of pain. You know, this idea of training, not straining. I think that's something that, that other forms of exercise can really learn from Tai Chi. Um, I practiced martial arts for many years before I came to Tai Chi. And I had a number of injuries from karate and Taekwondo and Jiu Jitsu. And Tai Chi did a lot to help me rehabilitate those personally. So I think there are safe ways of practicing. And I think that Tai Chi can, can really help teach us a lot about that. 
So I, I do think it's possible to get these benefits from other arts if the other arts can, can learn um, this approach. So Michelle has a question. How does Tai Chi differ from learning a new dance or dancing in general as it relates to brain health? Dancing is great for brain health. That was um, one of the things that, that came out of that conference that I was at um, uh, on, on the arts and the brain, um, especially partner dancing. So in Tai Chi, um, you're doing a lot of the same things that you're doing with dance. Um, and, and partner dancing. A, a, a good friend of mine in Finland who practices basic Tai Chi, um, and I was trying to encourage her to, to try to find a teacher to teach her partner Tai Chi, and she just couldn't find it in Finland. So I said, well, you know, think about partner dance because um, you're dealing with a lot of the same kinds of executive functions there. So I think that dance has a lot um, to offer. Um, one way that Tai Chi is a little bit different is that dance doesn't necessarily involve mindfulness. If, um, and mindfulness is, well, there's a whole can of worms there we probably don't have time to go into, but the meditative aspects of Tai Chi are unique from dance, but I do think that dance can provide a one, a, a many, many benefits um, for cognition. And also I've seen some, some studies on partner dance and Parkinson's disease which is a very hot area right now with Tai Chi and Parkinson's disease. Um, and I think um, that the dance um, uh, can be tremendously beneficial. Um, the mindfulness aspects of, of Tai Chi um, are not found in many dances. Um, and so, you know, someone could get that simply by finding a seated meditation practice to attend on, you know, once or twice a week. And doing dance. So it's not necessary if there's no Tai Chi in your area. You know, there are, there are other ways of getting these benefits. If you go to see the meditation once or twice a week and then you dance once or twice a week, there's no reason to suspect that the outcomes would be different than doing Tai Chi. All right, and I think our last question, and just for the rest of you, there is a link in the chat box you might want to explore after the webinar. But someone asked, what are some examples of other mind-body practices? Um, so uh, there are a group of mind-body practices referred to as Qigong, um, but it's pretty wide and, and wide and varied. Um, so some Qigong involves breathing, movement, and meditation, just like Tai Chi does. Probably the biggest difference is that most Qigong doesn't have a sort of basis in the martial arts necessarily, although it's oftentimes found practice with many martial arts. Um, uh, and so um, other mind-body practices might involve things like Reiki, which we don't have a whole lot of research on. Um, of course, yoga. Um, some people will put Pilates um, in, this, uh, in this category. Um, here at the university, students sometimes come to me in my mind-body health class, and um, I give them extra credit for exploring practices in the community, and they say, well, what about Zumba? Does Zumba count? And I tell them, yeah, you know what? Zumba, um, uh, your, Zumba affects your, your mood. Um, it affects the state of emotion um, uh, that you're experiencing. You're moving. You're paying attention to what's going on. You've got this, this, this wonderful... Um, community spirit in the class. So I think that anything where you are intentionally um, regulating posture, um, challenging your balance, uh, having to think and make decisions about how to move, um, anything that you're doing that helps you um, regulate your emotional state, uh, I would say that, that any of these things would fall into this category of mind-body exercise. Well, thank you very much. And that brings us to the close of our webinar. Special thanks to Dr. McGrath and Dr. Kamelski. And I'd also like to thank our team. And um, our team consists of Julie England, Wendy Dahl, Wendy Lynch, Kendra Zamoyski, all from Florida, and Carlin Raffi from Virginia. I'm Julie Garden Robinson from North Dakota. And we hope that we see you at our next, our next webinar in about a month. We have two more left in the series, and thanks everyone for being here today.